we've got uh, Dr. Jason T and Mike Ashford, who are going to uh, bit a double act. So Jason, originally from South Africa, senior lecturer in sports coaching here at Leeds Beckett, and Mike Ashford, um, PhD student here at Leeds Beckett as well, talking on how to blend the science, art, and coaching through tactical periodization for development, performance, and injury reduction. So over to you guys. Uh, thanks a lot, Rob. Thanks for the introduction. Um, not, not that you didn't give us a great introduction, but I thought there were a couple more salient details that we needed to share with you, um, really because it, it gives some context to where this, this discussion comes from. So, yeah, Mike is a PhD student uh, researching decision-making in sport here at Leeds Beckett, uh, but he's also a very, very accomplished rugby coach. Um, he, you know, he's worked for, for a couple of different teams, but probably the, the two roles he's been in most recently is he's been working with the Leeds Beckett se second side, uh, won promotion with them last season and had a very good season with them this year, and he's also currently working with Harrogate Rugby in the National Third Division. Um, me on the other end, I'm a bit of a jack of all trades, master of none. I suppose principally I'm a, I'm a strength and conditioning coach, um, but I also try my hand at coaching from time to time. Um, so I do a bit of work as a defense coach and, and breakdown coach. Um, and what's quite notable is Mike and I have worked together. Um, and this talk that we're going through today about uh, tactical periodization, I'm quite happy to say originated from a discussion that we had on a bus together, heading to a fixture with our players on the way up to, to Glasgow. Uh, we saw a news article about, you know, what tactic, uh, the fact that perhaps Eddie Jones in England were using tactical periodization with not much detail. And then we, we wanted to have a bit more of a think about what that might mean in a coaching context. So that's our background. Um, and now a couple of stories. Um, I worked with a coach a little while ago. He wasn't Wayne Smith. He was very good, but you know, I'm not trying to associate myself with the All Blacks or anything. Um, but the point of it is I got myself into that role where I was being a sports scientist, strength and conditioning coach, um, and the coach was, was doing his best with a, a new team of players that had recently been thrown to, together. And I was continually doing that thing that, uh, that coaches hate sports scientists doing and saying, oh, coach, spending too much time out on the field, our training sessions are too long, too much time on our feet, um, too much of this, too much standing and huddlings and, and talking, can't we get a, a stimulus through training? And you're making me have to cut back on the things that we have to do because the training sessions are too long. Um, and for the benefit of the slide, I've just said that the, uh, the coach said, well, mate, you're going to have to get used to it. How else are they going to learn? But more realistically, he told me to piss off and get back in my box. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, the person whose head was going to roll if the team didn't, uh, didn't get results was him and probably me along with them. So, uh, you know, that led to a couple of lines of thought for me. And one of those is this. I think that we've all had this scenario, at least strength and conditioning coaches, where we've coached these athletes that in the gym or on the track, they put up real impressive numbers. And they get out on the field and they, they just don't do the business for you, okay? That, that sort of looks like Tarzan plays like Jane scenario. Um, and so what I really thought about is, if you don't know the, the guy on the left, um, it's a great story, this. He is Jason Flex Lewis, who has just equaled Arnold Schwarzenegger's record of winning Mr. Olympia six times in a row. So objectively, this man has the best physique on the planet. And as yet, to my knowledge, he's not received a Wales call up yet. So the point I'm trying to make with this is, if it's all about physical prowess, then surely this guy's a shoe in for the side, but he's clearly not. So, you know, this comes down to what are coaches and then strength and conditioning coaches in team sport trying to achieve. And I think that right at the start, as a strength and conditioning coach, you've got to put yourself in the, in the jet stream, okay? You've got to get behind the coach and find out where it is that he's hoping to go, and then you've got to make sure that you're not a force that's detracting from that, and you, you guys got to start pulling in the same direction. So coaches, like everyone in life, are time poor, and their challenge is in a really complex environment of rugby where there's lots of skills to master and you know, there's 15 players on the field, lots of coordination between players to get right, they need to find effective ways of getting that organization onto the field, okay? 
Now, the difficulty in that is that you've got to make your, your, your skill acquisition as uh, sort of representative as possible. We know that it doesn't work. If you do it in an abstract environment that's too different from the, from the on-field environment, from the playing environment, you just don't get any transfer. And when you're trying to do that type of learning, it takes a hell of a long time. So what we need to try and do is create a situation where we maximize that time for coaches. On the other hand, strength and conditioning coaches, you probably have to acknowledge that you are the less important person in, in this scenario, important by all means, but at the end of the day, the players have to go out on the field and do a job that's not related to how much weight they can lift or how fast they can run. Although maybe if they have the ability to transfer those skills from the weightlifting room or the track onto the field, it might, might uh, give them the ability to perform better. So we need to be principally concerned with that transfer. How do we get them to use the physical abilities that they've got in a competition format? So interestingly, uh, both of, for me anyway, both of these problems come towards the same solution. So for a start, we, um, there's quite a lot of, uh, of research, objective research to back, back up game-based approaches to coaching. Um, Historically, you know, Tan's work on teaching games for, for understanding, uh, constraints-based coaching, and even more re recently, um, shameless plug here for myself and Mike, we put out a paper on tactical periodization for rugby. We'd really appreciate if you'd read it. Um, it'll certainly make our ratings go up, so if you can do that, that'd be great. Um, but there's, based on those, those other researchers, there's good reasons to use game-based training as an approach. But, and we often forget this, uh, there's a lot of good information around the uses of game-based training to achieve physical outcomes. Now, this is a, an old study by, by anyone's standards now, more than 10 years old, but Tim Gabbard showed that you could get pretty good physical responses out of a game-based approach to preparing for a, for a rugby league season. Um, what I really like is that bit down the bottom where both, both these teams, one played games in order to get fit, the other game, the other used traditional conditioning. They won the same amount of, of games, but look at the points difference. Objectively, you would say that the, the game-based team played better rugby. You know, they, they came up with solutions to the performance problems ahead in front of them a lot better. So, you know, perhaps there's something that we can learn from that. So this um, ties into this idea of uh, tactical periodization. Now, tactical periodization originated in Portugal. Uh, this gentleman up here is Vitor Freyde, or Frade, uh, who's the grandfather of tactical periodization. That quote from his um, hasn't come across particularly neatly on the, on the slide. It was better when I wrote it. Um, but anyway, he talks about the sanctity of the unbreakable entirety of the game, which is quite flowery probably because it was direct, uh, translated directly from Portuguese. But basically what he... His, his mantra is that when you are coaching these complex games, you can't say, right boys, today we're doing fitness, so we're gonna go run up and down the field X amount of times. Right, now you're not getting fit anymore, now we're getting better at football, now we're gonna kick the ball a little bit. Right, stop that, now go to the psychologist, he's gonna deal with your mental skills. What we've gotta do is understand that in the moments that matter in those games, all of those things are interacting. And so the way to train those should be interacting with all of them. So we need to give holistic consideration to our training. Um, a better way to think of it is uh, perhaps this. Often we, we see teams or clubs or whatever where uh, you've got the coaching staff on one end of the boat and the strength and conditioning staff on the other end of the boat um, and the boat's sinking. They're not winning games, but neither's willing to concede. So, hey man, it's all right. You know, my, my numbers in the gym are superb. I can show you that this team has gotten stronger over time. We haven't won a game this season, but don't worry, my, my house is in order. And that, that's absolutely the wrong approach. So we need to try and break down these, these silos between strength and conditioning and technical, tactical, and all other members of the, of the multidisciplinary team. And we've got to, got to get to a place where we can intermesh our practice, where we can understand the areas of overlap. Um, I've often in, in talks before said, as a sports scientist, strength and conditioning coach, it's really hard because the person in sole charge of the training load of the team really is the coach. He's the one who decides what they do with 80% of their time. So if you want to get involved with that rather than fighting against that, then somehow you've got to start align, aligning your goals. Um, 
so that's a, a pretty brief introduction to where we're going in this talk. Um, what, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand over to Mike, and Mike's really going to give us quite a high-level uh, introduction to what a coach might do in terms of his planning, how he might set out his, his stall for the season so that uh, everyone's got a good picture in their minds of what they might be working towards when we get into a tactical periodization framework. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Jace. Um, yeah, so I'm going to start basically with this question. Um, and I want to reiterate the message that tactical periodization, as with all the guys who have spoken this morning, starts with the game in mind and the demands of that game. Okay, now, if we look at this question here, what is a coach trying to achieve? It's basically an interaction between these three things within rugby union. And I will use rugby union as the example throughout, because unfortunately that's the only thing I know. Um, now, it starts with a prelusory goal. So any invasion game has an overall aim. Okay, and that is basically to score more points than your opponent. And obviously, as with any invasion game, you have a set of rules. Okay, uh, very fashionably named constitutive rules. And it is the interaction between these two things which then shapes the way the game is played. Now, I just want you to reflect on the three people, if you know them on the screen. Eddie Jones, Joe Smith, and Gregor Townsend. And just think about how they approach that interaction okay, between the prelusory goal and the rules. Now, linking on to this, for tactical periodization starts with these ideas and moments of the game. And they simplify the moments of the game as much as possible. So offensive organization, defensive organization. And more so in rugby union than any invasion sport, there is always a contest for possession from face to face. Now, a, a colleague of ours, Sergio Lara Bercial, um, re has recently done some research on serial, serial winning coaches who identify that is the ability to simplify these moments of the game, to understand them in their highest level of complexity and have the vision, okay, to go past that and come up with new tactical approaches. Now, what I want to start with is this is a very simple model of rugby union that me and Jason have come up with. Now, I'm going to use an example of Eddie Jones. Now, this game model, okay, gives him a system or way of playing. All right? So those moments of the game are captured within his mind, and give th that, that gives birth to this idea of a system. Now, recently in literature, um, a woman who works quite closely with us, Pam Richards, came up with the idea of a shared mental model. Now, this wasn't just simply the system of way of playing in the coach's mind, but was transferred to all stakeholders within that system. And by system, I mean everyone within that team. So just on the, on the screen there, you've got the assistant coaches, the scrummaging coach, sports psychologist, S&C coach. So the tactics aren't simply prescribed or given to the playing group or the coaches. It's to everyone within that system. So everyone's working towards those aims. Now, this starts with a mental model. All right. And to put it simply, a mental model is simply performance problems born from the moments of the game. So offensive organization gives you, more, gives you a certain set of problems you need to overcome in order to meet that prelusory goal of scoring more points than your opponent. Now, a mental model is simply what are the best tactical solutions available to you as a coach in order to get, meet that prelusory goal. And this then gives you an alpha version. Okay, so the best possible version of what those solutions are. But before you do this, surely you've got, to, you've got to understand some key issues. First of all, you've got, to look at the, you've got to have knowledge of your own players' limitations. What can they achieve? What can they do? What's their physical profile like? You've got to have an understanding of the rules of the game. Or, and most importantly, future rule changes. I think the scrummaging rules have changed about 27 times in the last four years. That's a perfect example of what that might mean. If you can predict these, then your alpha version will be a much higher level. And also, have an understanding of your competition demands, of where you are, but also where you want to get to. Now, if you can then conceptualize these within your own mental model of the game as a coach, you can start to prescribe a performance vision, all right? a vision of exactly where you want to get to. Now, this performance vision then gives birth to a tactical demand. So every moment of the game will have a tactical demand aligned to it. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. The tactical demand then drives what you need to require physically, 
technically, psychologically. Okay? And this quote just encapsulates that perfectly. What is tactical desirable, uh, tactically desirable must be technically plausible. And if we can conceptualize that within our own mind as a coach, we can begin to understand the skill sets that are required from our performance vision. We can clearly define the skill requirements, psychological requirements of what we want to achieve. And most importantly, begin to plan curriculums. Start to think about how we're going to educate our playing group to meet these demands. So, I identified before this idea of a shared mental model. Now, at the moment, this performance vision is completely within the mind of the coach. Now, I've spoken to a number of people within the RFU that would completely disagree with this, and that's why it's very important with the shared notion. Now, the coach, if he's going to share this me mental model, needs to be scrutinized by the playing and coaching group. Okay, so the tactical solutions need to be given freely to the playing group, to the other coaches, to turn around and say, well, hold on a second, what do I bring to this playing framework as a fly half? Or as a coach, do I agree with this? This doesn't really match my skill set and what I want to educate. And then they come mutually to a conclusion of what's the best fit for that system. What do we all align to in order to meet the requirements of our performance vision? And most importantly, Pam talks about a common language. Okay, I'm sure you've all been in systems where everyone has calls for certain tactics. Common language starts to emerge. Now, this is an example of a shared mental model. And let me reiterate, this isn't to prescribe tactical solutions, and nor is it to constrain decision making. Okay, it's, it's, it's a system that allows freedom, okay, to make decisions within that, down to knowledge. Now, Fraud, as we've said before, talks about the system being born in the player's mind first. Now, if you look on uh, for each of these moments of the game, the attack, defense, the transition, there are principles and sub-principles mm -hmm. that align to it. So within attack, you might have scoring, you might have progression of the ball, and each of these then has to have a, te a tactical requirement in order to overcome. Now, that's all well and good having a conceptual idea, but what's important is being able to implement this. Now, unfortunately, I'm going to give that old uh, answer of it, it depends. It depends on your context, and it depends on what you're trying to achieve within your system. What are your long-term goals? What are the job demands? Okay? So your priorities should drive how you plan and implement your shared mental model. Okay? Do you have an academy set up where results don't matter? Where you might have a group of guys who are going for England 18s or 20s, therefore you might not focus on your own requirements, you might focus on theirs. You might withdraw them and work on their action capabilities and skill sets. Vice versa, you might be absolutely defined by KPIs and week-to-week -week results. Therefore, your shared mental model is essential. And therefore, everything should be focused on the priority of what needs developing at that time. Is it defense? Is it attack? Is it goal line defense, the line out? Now, let me reiterate, there is no one-size-fits-all here, and there's no golden chalice. But if you plan long-term, it makes the week-to-week short-term much simpler. Okay, and that's a connection between what Andy Abraham would call classical decision making from a long term point of view and naturalistic decision making from a short term point of view. I'll hand back over to Jason now who's going to jump on how we can integrate both from a head coach point of view but also strength and conditioning wise. Um, so this next part of our talk is... Um, really about what do we do to operationalize this. So between, if it was Mike and I, we now have, it, with our players and whoever else is involved in our group, we've got a really good idea of what, what we're trying to achieve, what's our style of play, what's our shape going to look like. Um, now, I want to start with, a, with the proviso right here, here and now. Um, perhaps tactical periodization doesn't belong at the car adolescent rugby research conference because maybe it's not the optimal way to develop adolescent athletes. We know that if we want to get people stronger, they need to lift up heavy things. If we want to make people run faster, we've got to get them practicing running. Thanks for that, uh, that, that gem from earlier, Rodri. He's, he's absolutely bang on. But if, if the thing that's going to make us successful is a really 
good cohesive understanding of how we deal with the, the performance problems that arise on the field, we can't have trainings that look like this. We've got to have people that are working together really, really effectively. Now, well, this is a different version of a, of a graph that we've seen a few times today, um, which I suppose from, from one point of view at least says that the, uh, the strength and conditioning coaches, the sports scientists and the coaches all agree with where we should have our contact training day in the week. Um, perhaps what we haven't got into in a great deal of depth is why it's so important to put that contact training day on the, on the Tuesday if you're playing Saturday to Saturday. Um, and if, you, if you're interested in this, Greg Rowe did some great work on this uh, last year and he presented at this conference and I'd suggest that you look up uh, this presentation. But essentially what we know from the, from the left hand side of the graph is when you, when you play a full contact rugby match, which, which they all tend to be, um, it takes you at least 48 hours to, to get physical recovery, in some cases even longer. But based on that, you don't want anyone to, to have to work too hard uh, to try and, in, uh, try and achieve intensity in training, certainly during the Sunday and the Monday at, at training. What also is quite important to note is that doing contact training has a similar effect depending on how you titrate it, how much contact you do. It's, it could have that 48 hour 48 hour window, but it's probably at least 24 hours that we need to recover. So that gives us an explanation for why that orange block is where, where it is. So when I'm working with my coach, I'm, I'm saying, well, look, at some stage during the week, you've, you're going to have a contact training outcome because we've got to train defense. It's one of our moments of the game. But let's just try and work within a framework that if we need to do that, let's try and get that work done on the Tuesday because then we can, we can get our physical outcomes in terms of recovery as well as achieve the coaching outcomes so that we can start working synergistically. Um, in terms of the, the goals for, for the other days, um, what I would suggest, and this is going to be fairly high level because um, you know, I don't want to give people rules that are going to be Im impossible to implement in their context. The idea here is that we want to try and create rules of thumb for coaches, some guidelines, with the, some frameworks to work within to, to say, you know what, the, the te technical tactical outcomes are, are yours and we don't want to take away from that. But if possible, if we can work within frameworks and we can prescribe things like field sizes, uh, number of attackers, number of defenders, uh, the level of contact on different days, maybe we can go quite a long way towards uh, satisfying both of our goals at the same time. We can get some physical development as well as some technical tactical work done. Um, so for a start, the, the first day of the week, the Monday, uh, which to all intents and purposes, we know that we can't hit maximal intensities because players are still fatigued fr from the weekend. Um, from the talks we saw earlier, some of them are, some of their work is referenced up there. We know that the average demands, if you just take total meters covered by, divided by the match time of rugby are not all that high. Okay, it's uh, to, to be able to go six, six kilometers in, in 80 minutes is not particularly challenging. I think that most of us in the room could do that with, with a lot to spare. Um, that load is, is grown by the fact that there's changes of direction, acceleration, de deceleration, so we've got to overcome some forces. But generally, we can meet that demand for sustained submaximal work capacity by organizing our drills according to those parameters. If we can get some large field sizes, um, some long work intervals and large teams, we, we should be able to exceed 100 meters per minute um, and that should give us the stimulation we need for that submaximal work capacity. If we start talking about our contact demands and we throw acceleration, deceleration into this because you've got to generate some momentum to be able to win contact and you've got to slow people down if you're going to win contact, uh, we, we throw all of those in together. Now, uh, having seen Dan's work today earlier, these guidelines probably need a, a little bit of reviewing if they're going to be applied in rugby league. But certainly in, in rugby union, we know that we're looking at probably one contact point every two minutes. The worst case scenario is basically one contact a minute for two and a half minutes before a stoppage in play. And we're working towards probably 25 tackles in a game in the worst case scenario and 70 rucks to go with that. So if we wanted to organize a training session to practice defense, breakdown, something like that, technical, tactical goals, but we wanted to exceed those so that we're preparing people for the demands of match play. In fact, hopefully making them feel like they, when they're out in a match, this is easier than training so they can cope with that more easily, then these might be the guidelines that we'd go with. Um, the final day, 
of the week is, uh, is a speed focus day. Now, uh, you know, when we say speed, this is probably the days where we'd like to exceed those maximal running demands. Um, you know, we've got over there uh, peak intensity of international rugby, 184 meters per minute. I just want you to bear in mind that that's basically less than a, that's just over a 5.15 per kilometer. Everyone in the room can run 5.15 per kilometer for two and a half minutes, I guarantee you that. But the important thing is that in turn, on top of that, there's gonna be some expressions of maximal velocity, and there also need to be some expressions of really, really accurate decision making. This is the, the day in the week where, it, from a coach's point of view, you, you're practicing those scenarios where you've created an overlap, you've created an opportunity, and you need to be able to score. We, under, we know that in team sports, scoring opportunities are almost always preceded by displays of max, maximal power or maximal velocity, so we need to try and build that into our training. And we believe that by, by, by creating this framework, but most notably by overloading the attack and underloading the defense so that you create space for the attack, you can achieve all of this. Now, just to say, I wouldn't want to stand up here and make you think that I've got this all worked out and that this is absolutely perfect. You know, the, the game is dynamic, and some days you, you plan something perfectly and you're pretty sure this drill's gonna work and then they just drop the ball all the time and you don't get the loading that you, that you particularly want. So there always has to be a, a check, a feedback loop where, we, where we're saying, well, these are the tactical outcomes we wanna achieve today, these are the physical outcomes we wanna achieve today, these are all the other outcomes we want to achieve today, and then we need to go back and check those. Now, depending on, on your environment, your context, you might be doing that simply through coach's eye. If, you, if you're in an academy or a club or something like that, you might have the use of GPS and, and video. Very, very important because we've got the option, just because we bought into tactical periodization, if we completely miss our physical load for the day, there's no reason why we can't go back out on the field and top that up. Okay, we still want to make sure that we, we're achieving, we're not, we're not submitting and saying, okay, well, we're not going to worry about physical outcomes anymore. So we need to do our best to, to check ourselves here. Just um, in terms of a, a little history lesson on uh, this idea of matching training outcomes to, uh, to what's happening on the field, this is an area that we're particularly bad at in rugby. And I'll put my hand up, I probably started it. Um, so I did that research a little while ago where I had a look at a couple of different things that we, we did in training and I compared it to the match outcomes. And uh, the tiny little triangles, the ones that are all above the, all, all below the gray bar that indicates match intensity, those, those are skill trainings. So in that particular environment at that time, the feedback to the coach was, we need to manipulate our training because yes, you're getting your skill outcomes, but it doesn't look anything like the game. It's not representative. It's all below the intensities that you're expecting on the weekend. So it's, it's too easy for the players. They will do it in this environment. They might not do it in that. Since then, we've, we've had a small, moderate in, improvement in this in that the next, uh, next group to go and match uh, training outcomes with match demands also had a look at some skill components. So a big failing of my research is we just had a look at how many meters were run and how fast they were run. We didn't, we didn't have a look at what the players were doing. In this, in this case, the second article you see over there, the players, uh, they counted. They counted how many kicks, how many passes, how many scrums, how many rucks. Excellent. So now we know that we do the same number of passes in a game as what we do in a match. We don't know how good those passes are, we don't know if the scenarios they were completed in are as complex as a match, but at least we know we're doing the same number. So the point that I'm trying to make is that we, we don't have a great idea or we're not very good yet at measuring the, the representativeness or the spe specificity of what we're doing in training. Now, just to, you know, something aspirational and hopefully as a challenge to, to guys like Nick and Dan and, and the other guys in, in the room, you, you spoke about what's potentially coming next in, uh, in sports science. This is happening in, uh, in Aussie rules football at, at the very least. We, we've got data scientists who are working with coaches, assessing their drills, both in terms of the physical outcomes that can be achieved and in terms of the skill outcomes and the representativeness of the training. So that as a coach, rather than just guessing and saying, well, let's try and put together this drill using these parameters, you can read down your, men your menu 
of, uh, of coaching drills, coaching activities and say, well, that's the one for today because that's going to get us the right number of contacts. That's going to get us a scenario that's similar to or exceeds what's going on in, in matches. Um, so that's my little bit on uh, possibly where we need to go with this in future. I'm now going to tee up Mike for, for his little bit. He's going to tell us uh, some about his PhD research. Um, and I'm just going to leave you with the question of, yeah, I think we can be more representative, but he's got something a little bit left field that I feel like most of us haven't considered in terms of how we can make our, our training more representative of what's going on in the matches. Thanks again, Jace. Um, I just want to start, uh, Nick, you said something earlier that really resonated with me and my research around the why. So we, we know what, we can identify what and how, but we can't really, uh, can't really identify why. Now, my PhD, stupidly I decided to define the role of decision making in an elite level rugby union, which um, I think is an impossible task to be honest, but I will try my best. Now, I've gone to the literature and I've realised that we, we in sport, we like to find a theory uh, when we can't explain something and we like to apply it practically, okay? And we use this theory born from completely different, different uh, paradigms, completely different contexts. So these words on here might just seem like a load of jargon, but some of you might have seen them before. So dynamical systems, ecological psychology, constraints, recognition prime, decision making, perceptual cognitive theory. They're all born from something other than sport, but yet have been applied within sport. Now that seems a little bit odd to me. So for example, recognition prime decision making comes from disaster recovery and fire services. Um, ecological psychology is born from nature and organizational rules within nature. And perceptual cognitive theory simply comes from this idea of making decisions within, the, within expertise. But these have been applied to rugby union, football, and hockey. And we base a lot of our empirically based decisions from this research. Now, we spent a whole day with some great research talking about the match demands and then how we can use our practice to match them. Now, I think that's imperative from a decision-making point of view as well. What are the match demands when it comes to the cognitive demands of the game? Rather than looking theory first, look at the demands of the game first. So, looking at the literature, three processes have emerged. And the reason why there's only three pieces and they don't make up the puzzle is because there's a shitload of other things that match up to this. And I'm not going to give you a one-size-fits-all. But these three processes are very different in nature. So the first one is from ecological psychology. This idea that decision-making is emergent. That it simply happens between the calibration of the person making the decision and their environment. And they don't actually think about it. I'm sure some of you will have questions of your own with that. Cognition that we are like computers, that we see something we, that we've seen before and we take the most important cues, we go back to our long-term working memory, decide on what the most optimum response is, and then we make the response. And then recognition prime decision making. Okay, that there's three tiers to the way we make decisions. If the situation's typical, we have a typical action. If the situation's not typical, we come up with the first best option and if the situation is typical, but there's loads of options, we, right, we go through an analytical process to come up with the best one. I hope you're still with me here. And I'm really sorry there is a lot of jargon within this. I will get to the point eventually. Okay, so within the literature, what I've found through visual search data is that there's been plenty and plenty of, of studies done around fixations and durations of fixations within the decision-making process, which pretty much means how long do I look at something in order to come to a decision? None of the data is replicable from study to study. Okay, none of the data is the same, and that's simply due to the task. Now, Marcus Raab um, has come up with this idea of complexity, that from situation to situation, the complexity of information might change. And basically, what, what is found is that highly complex situations tend to demand explicit processing of information. So if we've got more time available to us and more pieces of information, we need to access what's the best option in front of me and what do I remember from my memory in order to come to that decision. Whereas low complex time and, and minimal time constraints 
simply don't allow us sufficient time to process information. And therefore, we use that calibration and attunement to the environment to self-organize, okay, and come to a decision. Now, I love this quote here. It's, Cognition is best understood by looking at its environment. Okay, and what I decided to do was try and grasp these four things on, on the screen there by asking players through an experiment of each of their action to classify along this continuum. So we've got this idea of emergence and self-organization, heuristics and simple match, di a diagnosis and tactically pre-planned. Now, I'm going to be completely honest with you. I piloted this and asked my players to tell me about whether they use heuristics and simple match, and I just had a stern look of bemusement at me. So I had to come up with a simpler way of voicing this. Now, it was very simple. Each of these match no thought, fast thought, and slow thought. Okay, so I, I, I've gone through the process with an, um, a sub-elite university side and asked them to tell me each of their actions, what did they classify it as? Now, you might be sitting there, why is this important? Well, we talk about how much running players do. We talk about the physical demands, the energy expenditure. But how much do we talk about the cognitive demand? How much do we talk about that internal logic and how that drives how we make decisions? And are our players in the best place to make the decisions? Now, all this literature suggests that training should be representative of the true environment. If we don't know the cognitive demands, how do we know if training is representative of the true environment? So, these three things, what I've begun, begun to do is apply and understand the cognitive demands in, in accordance with each of the moments of the game. Okay, so the cognitive demand for transition from attack to defense might be completely dif different to the cognitive demand for defensive organization. And with this, you can start to align pedagogical strategies, so how you create a learning environment to optimize their learning in order to meet that shared mental model you have. So basically, no thought, Aligns very, if, if they don't think through the decision when they make a decision, why would you tell them what decision they need to make? Okay, so if we're putting players into representative practice and that, that, that so it's a winger in a one on one situation, they've got no time to make a decision, then don't tell them. Put them in a game where they do it over and over again and give them a goal to achieve. Okay, nonlinear pedagogy, constraints led. Use the rules and let that drive learning. But don't feed back around what that decision is. Just let it emerge. And goal direction and, intent and intention. Okay, if you tell them what they need to achieve but don't give them the process, that matches up to the cognitive demand. Fast thought, simple options. This is where you can start to be explicit. Okay, so you can start to say, right, right, so you've got two options available to you. If this happens, choose that one. If that happens, choose this one. Okay, and explicit guidance, explicit guidance of the risks. Okay, Anne Clary Macker has done some amazing research on basketball players and what makes players stick to the playbook or change the play. And it's very much intertwined with fast thought processes. And slow thought as well. Declarative knowledge is the most important aspect to decision making. If you understand why you're doing something, then your decision making will be more optimum, regardless of whether it's no thought or slow thought. Now, what I'm trying to get at is if we can start to identify the patterns from moment to moment in the game, it's not what is tactically desirable must be technically possible. It's what is tactically desirable must be technically, physically, and psychologically possible. Mike. Can I just jump in for a second there? Because you know, my, my limited defense knowledge is wearing here. So I've used this type of drill in the past. So I want to practice defense. I want to practice tackle technique. So I line up an attacker over there, defender over there. I tell the defender that the attacker's coming and that he should, uh, should tackle him to the best of his ability. But it doesn't happen like that in the game. Are you saying that, that I'm probably getting the, the training prescription wrong? Yeah, it's completely wrong. Um, uh, the, the results from our first study, if we run the frequencies of tackles, um, over 75% were no thought. And the majority of those that involved thought were when the player either missed the tackle or had significant amounts of time to make a huge hit. So players don't have time to think about tackles. So we've got to give them 
an action capability, get a, get a motor skill inside of them, and then hope that they, they're going to react appropriately and maybe give them opportunities to react appropriately. Yeah, of course. I mean, you can't put someone in a 5v5 situation where there's significant amounts of tackles if they don't have the technical capability to do so. But once that technical capability has been developed, it's about putting them in a game situation where the goal is perhaps to make two positive contacts behind the game line. So you take it away from the technique and more about the goal direction and intention. Fantastic. Well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here first. We need to start prescribing our training based also on the amount of time that our players have for decision making in order to make it more representative. Um, so it just falls to me to sort of sum up what, we, what we've said here today. Um, I think that there, there's a few things. One, uh, you know, we, we are both believers that we, we wouldn't stand up and tell you this is the way to do something if we hadn't tried it in our own practice. So at the very least, anecdotally, uh, tactical periodization is a really great way to improve team cohesion and understanding. All right. Um, it's for us, it's a way better way of ensuring that our training matches with the game demands. Um, I've I've sat here a couple of times today thinking, wow, you know, we're getting really, really specific with our analysis and we're starting to think about, you know, what sort of job does a, does a fullback do in this type of situation on the field and how can we create a training that's going to represent those physical loads for him. Perhaps the better strategy is to just create situations in training that are going to look a lot like what, he's, what he does on the field and then everyone, by performing their positional roles in training, is also going to get a really specific training stimulus. And I think that by doing this, we can ensure that whatever physical capabilities the, our players have, they learn to hone these and use these as effectively as possible on the field. Um, that said, you know, anecdotally, we, th we think that, uh, that there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of mileage to be gained with this approach. Um, it's based on some, some pretty solid theory around game-based uh, game learning, uh, teaching games for understanding, things like that. But we'd be liars if we said that we'd, uh, we'd gone out here and measured absolutely everything that we need to do to give you a firm recommendation. So this isn't going to turn up in, in an RFU training manual just yet. But that works on going, and uh, hopefully watch the space. Hopefully we want to uh, be back here next year and be able to present uh, some, some more experiences and some more findings on this. Um, for us, some of the questions that we, that we really want to answer is can we objectively show that tactical periodization improves physical and tactical outcomes for teams? Uh, we want to understand how long this process takes to embed. Um, with that, we want to understand whether it's appropriate for developing athletes or if you would only use this in, in sort of senior professional competition. Uh, those types of questions are, are pretty important to us. Um, if anyone out there is, is using this type of approach or is interested in using this, this type of, of approach, we, we'd love to, to hear fr from you um, to just find out how you're using it in, in your environment and find out if maybe we can, can use you as, as test subjects and, and come in and measure some of these things and maybe we can do some of that learning together. So thanks very much for your time. I realize it was slightly different than, uh, than some of the other content, but hopefully you, you've all gotten something out of that. Thank you. We're slightly pushed for time, but has anyone got any questions out in the, on the floor? Yeah. Hi. Um, I've been using the tactical periodization in football, obviously. It's... It started off in football, and um, a lot of the reading and the research around it talks about cognitive load, which you've talked about there. Um, and then certain days, uh, with the low physical load um, and low cognitive load, and then your sort of acquisition days, the cognitive load increases as well as the physical. Um, have you thought about periodizing what you've just said there in terms of explicit and implicit strategies? in terms of the acquisition days and the recovery days? 
I think it, I think there's quite a simple answer from my perspective. It just comes back to what you're trying to achieve and what your priority is at that given time. Um, I, I don't know if any of you have read Legacy um, around the All Blacks. There is a phenomenal quote in there where Richie McCaw talks about the fact that um, they trained at a higher intensity than the game. And what he meant by intensity wasn't simply the physical intensity or tactical intensity, but also the, the cognitive load was harder than the game. The, and he spoke about the actual performance being in slow motion. And I think that if, you, if you're planning, if you, if you tactically periodize over a long period of time and you know what you want to achieve at certain periods, and then you use your week to week as that feedback basis, you begin to paint a much nicer picture of what you're aiming to achieve from session to session. And therefore, you can start to shape your load with a much more explicit knowledge of that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. If I could just jump on that a little bit more. I know that we, we're out of time, but um, and maybe we didn't have time to get into that. But yeah, there, there are certainly days where we would like to put our players under, under more pressure. So it's not just from a skill point of view, but but you know to try and create some some consequences. Maybe we'd change our behaviours as as coaches, and uh, and we we'd start uh, sort of shouting and, and demanding and just creating more pressure uh, to try and increase those mental loads. At the same time, we also might know there's times where where the players have come off a, a difficult weekend or something like that, and we just want them to be successful in training. So we might choose a relatively simple task for the, for the players, but know that they, they're going to be successful and that that's going to decrease stress, give them more confidence, things like that. So yeah, it's, it is certainly a consideration within this. Thanks very much. Perfect. Well, round of applause for Mike and Jason.